This is Amanda LaPlante. You're listening to Get Real to Heal on KWRHLP 92.9 FM. And with me again is Pete Sandoval of New Insights Counseling. So glad that you're you're able to stick around and share some more knowledge. Great. I'm, I'm glad to be able to do that. It's an honor. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to have you. And I want to give a quick shout out to AFC Urgent Care of Brentwood and say thank you so much to them for underwriting this show. Um, don't try riding out the flu alone this season. There's a lot of weird stuff going on out there. We've got flu, strep coronavirus, God forbid, um, all kinds of things going on. So if you've got a sick loved one or if you're sick yourself and you're really concerned about it, get into the, ur- the urgent care or go see someone near you and get that checked out. Get it tested. It'll give you peace of mind. They can treat you. Um, you know, at AFC Urgent Care, it's right across from City Hall in Brentwood. They're open seven days a week beyond traditional physician office hours. So if you're after hours and you're concerned, you can go and get taken care of there uh, right on the spot. Their team is led by physicians, so you'll see a doctor every time that you visit. And they are proud to underwrite Get Real to Heal, and they're ready for you to take care of your family's urgent care needs anytime. AFCUrgentCare.com slash Brentwood to find out more information about them. And I'm so proud to have them on as a sponsor, and I love that they, they sponsor great information like, like what you're bringing out to us today. I think trauma is such an important topic. Mm-hmm. It can't be understated. It cannot, especially in today's world. It is just I'm definitely seeing more and more people who are impacted on a regular basis with a lot of the things going on today. Yeah, so we, we left off, you know, for, for this and other episodes of Get Really Hill, by the way, you can go to soundcloud.com slash get really hill, check that out anytime. You can also go to Facebook and see the Facebook Live if you're listening on the radio. Um, go to facebook.com slash get real to heal or slash AK LaPlante and check that out. And we left off in the last episode with a question that someone had mm-hmm. about, they said they didn't really care for EMDR, they preferred CBT. Mm-hmm which is Cognitive Behavioral Therapy? That's correct. Oh, wow, I'm talking ding, way ding, above ding, my pay grade the, here. You get the yeah. magic prize for the day. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so why would someone prefer that te- technique over something like, which we talked about in the previous episode, mm-hmm. so go back and check that out, EMDR, which is, uh, so we talked all about that, but so Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, what would be the reason? Well, I'm going to have to, I'm, I'm going to take a speculative guess, if you will, about possibly why they may prefer it. So, As I mentioned earlier, one of the things that occurs in EMDR is that um, we are intentionally going in and trying to stir the pot. We want someone to feel the sensations, thoughts, feelings, whatever that come up related to the trauma. I don't know about you, but if anybody said, this is what we're going to do, I'd say, heck no, I'm not going to do that. I mean, it's just natural to not, pain is uncomfortable. The part of our brain that feels Physical pain is the same part of our brain that processes emotional tra- pain. It's uncomfortable. Why would I want to say, yeah, sure, poke me in the arm. It feels good. You know, it doesn't feel good. That's normal. That's natural. That's very understandable. I don't know what this particular person's experience was. However, what I have heard from other clients who've come in to see me or who I've talked to, um, even other therapists, is sometimes uh, there are some folks who don't have a very broad depth of trauma training as part of their EMDR training. They're usually not together. EMDR training is its own thing. Some training um, institutes or whatever will incorporate some level of trauma-informed care or trauma training as part of it, but many of them don't. So a lot of it depends on the therapist, and this is not to put anybody down or say anybody's bad, it's about experience, really. And even in my early days of EMDR, there were a lot of things I had to learn. I had good support. I had also done a lot of my own trauma work prior to it. So I think I had a good, as a therapist, a good stable foundation. The other thing is that um, sometimes people don't understand or sometimes just bottom line, it's just too overwhelming. I mentioned accelerated resolution therapy specifically and why I like it more, not only because it's faster, but because it's better containment of those feelings. So getting back to the question, it is very possible that this person had a negative experience with EMDR. It was just too overwhelming. And as far as I'm concerned, if that person felt that and they said CBT works better, I say honor that. That is your body and brain saying this works better. This feels safer for me. This is what I want to do. And I encourage you to stay on that path. And if at some other point, another mode of therapy sounds more appealing and you want to try something different, by all means do so. What we know about cognitive behavioral therapy from years of research related to trauma is that it does provide relief 
that it often, because it's more cognitively oriented, it doesn't get to the body sensations. So the long-term relief that people would like to have from trauma very often doesn't come about. They may feel better, maybe for years they feel really good, their life goes on and they're doing fine. Inevitably what can happen, and this is not, again, a, a wholesale everybody, because everybody's different. Sometimes CBT may be just enough, person feels just enough, and they move on and they're fine. They don't need anything, need anything else. That being said, what can happen with a lot of trauma that gets stuck for people is at some point something else happens. Normal life events, death of a loved one, divorce, car crash, um, loss of a job, anything like that, that becomes a trauma in and of itself, but it also taps into that earlier trauma that didn't fully get resolved out of the body and connects to it. The brain and, and body don't interpret and don't dis discriminate or can't differentiate between the two. It just knows that this feels like an experience that I've had before and brings it back to the forefront. So that's why, despite the fact that I think CBT is great, it works well, works for a lot of things, it is not my preferred method for working with trauma, simply because my personal and professional experience tells me that it won't provide the long-term relief that most of my clients are looking for. And, as I said before, I encourage clients to do whatever feels right for them. And, you know, sometimes it's hard for people to even get yet. I want to go back to where you said, you know, it's kind of like, okay, who wants to be poked? Like, who really wants to experience that that's discomfort right. that's going to come up from inevitably trying to process these past traumas? Right. Um, you know, so regardless of the modality that you use, I think the important thing is that people just start. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are afraid to just start. What are some reasons people might be avoiding going in, in addressing trauma in the first place? Well, we've touched on a little bit, and I think it continues to go into that. It's a matter of self-preservation. We talked about this is all about survival, and sometimes my survival instinct says, I don't want to feel that, or this is scary to think about going in and exploring where I've come from, who I am, what's happened to me, or what's going on, and how it's impacting my life in that way. Well, or how often are we just lying to ourselves? Honestly, I, I, I want to just say that. I, I, for years, was just lying to myself and telling myself that I was fine, that I should mm -hmm. suck it up, that I should move on, that this was a thing that happened, but it didn't define me, and I was just fine. Well, <laughs> What do so, you have to say about that? Well, I think, that's, I think that's one way to look at it, and I think that there's a lot of truth in it. And what I would say is it's also a higher-order cognitive level of self-protection. And so while it is lying to ourselves, I am cautious about throwing that label on too strictly, if for no other reason, because it becomes shaming and becomes self-defeating if I'm telling, well, I'm just lying to myself. Well, sometimes we actually need to in order to survive or get through something. And sometimes we need to keep that in place until we're ready to actually look at the deeper truth. I like the way you untangled that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's okay. And um, everything is all about self-protection, feeling safe, feeling okay, and getting through whatever it is we need to get through. And we each have various ways that we've adapted. And that's what the stress response cycle is all about, is adaptations, and whether the adaptation worked back then to help me get through it, and whether it's working now in my life or not. And at some point, the delusion that it's still working when it isn't usually will hit that life event that says, oh no, this ain't going to work this time. And then people will have that moment to go, hmm, maybe it's time to find a different way of going at it. And then a deeper truth starts to emerge. I, I had, of course, a triggering life event. I, we would call that getting triggered, right? Sure. Okay, and I think the thing is that's used as slang nowadays. Everybody just throws out, yeah. oh, you just got triggered. But, but really, there's these triggering life events that will bring up this deeper past trauma, and it just um, you know adds to the layer of what you're dealing with currently. But I, I had that happen to me, and I actually had some repressed memories. You talked in the last episode about... Um, the memory centers mm -hmm. and re rewiring that memory reconsolidation right mm -hmm. um, 
I had a repressed memory that, that came up as a result of a triggering event that led me to uncover a childhood trauma that I then went to my mom and said, hey, this I'm having this weird dream. This thing keeps happening to me. Mm-hmm. It doesn't feel like a dream. It feels like a memory. And she said, yeah, because it is. Mm. And confirmed that this thing had happened to me when I was really small. And how, how, I still don't really know how to unravel that mm-hmm. for myself. What are your thoughts on, on situations like that? Hmm. Well, first of all, um, it's in, the most important thing to me always is um, whatever a client brings to me as far as whether um, something that they believe is repressed is less important whether it actually happened or not. It's, it's wonderful if they can get it confirmed. But if it's creating a problem that's getting in the way, whether it's real or not, is less important to me than... It's something that is in the way of what, how they want to deal with or work in their life at that point in time. So I deal with it as if it's real in the brain and the body, and we move it out in whatever way seems to work for that client. Yeah, okay. And it, it, I just thought it was amazing, though, like looking at it now, you know, being on the other side of, of all of this reprocessing and... Mm-hmm. It's amazing. My brain was protecting me from, yes. from this, and it just partitioned off That's right. this memory that it knew was going to be harmful to me. That's right. And that's fascinating. And that circles back around to something that you had said earlier about why do people sometimes not want to go or hesitate? Because of, we're in self-protection, and it's only when we're ready to look at and deal with and work through things that we actually make the choice to do so. And any number of things can bring that to the forefront, whether it's a life event, circumstance, illness, or you name it. So you've been on your own health journey prior to coming to this field. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, what can you share with people about what got you started? Um, life event. You know, my first marriage was not going very well. I had a five-year-old son that was struggling due to the marital difficulty, so the relationship and the family was not going very well. And I realized I needed to get some help. And of course, at the time, like so many people, um, my first thought was, well, she's the problem, or this is the problem, or that's the problem. It's my work, it's my job, whatever. And come to find out, it's not just that, it's how I am internalizing, how I'm processing it, the choices that I made to get myself into this relationship, into this situation, and also within the relationship itself, how I'm choosing to not handle it. A lot of those adaptive skills that I learned growing up in relationships weren't working for me anymore. They worked for me as a kid, they helped me get through and survive some difficult uh, life events. And they're not working now as an adult in, in a trying to be in a committed, loving relationship. And they weren't working for me as well all the time as a father. And I said, I need to work on me. I need to do this work. And so I started digging in. And similar to you, there was a couple of repressed memories that came up. I knew that my life had been difficult and there had been a lot of stuff that had happened. I didn't know that there were things that I had compartmentalized and put into a little box because I wasn't ready for them until I started working on myself and realized, oh my gosh, there's stuff here that's even bigger and more overwhelming that I wasn't ready for. I guess now is the time to look at them and work through them. There have been moments in my marriage when we would have an argument, and this is this was part of what launched me into my, my therapy process. We would have an argument, and I would hear these things come out of my mouth that were almost not even my words. And, and I thought, that's not me, that's my mom, or that's my grandpa, oh, yeah. or mm-hmm. what happens? Well, it's funny you say that, because when I think about my story, one of, in my journey, one of the things that was a real eye-opening piece for me was one day, I remember my son was about five, five and a half, six years old, somewhere in that neighborhood, and I was frustrated, he was just being a kid, And I happened to look down and I got angry and was scolding him. And the look on his face spoke volumes to me. And in the back of my mind, it was the exact same experience. I thought, this is my mom's voice and tone and demeanor that's coming out right now at him. And that's what it felt like for me. Seeing his face was like, oh my God, that was me. That's what I used to feel like. What am I doing here? 
what's wrong with this picture? And that was one of the real big moments I'll never forget. Obviously, it's, it's stamped in my brain that I need to do something about me. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it just wakes you up when you when you have that experience. And I wonder how how often I feel like I was on autopilot for years. Mm -hmm. You know, we are we're we're on autopilot. Um, before the show, we were talking a little bit about the brain, body, and all of that, and how things are internalized and become just part of our normal everyday functioning. And again, it's just it's what an SE would call procedural or implicit and explicit memory. They're just in in uh, part of our neurophysiology that I say, think, act, believe, and, and move my body in certain ways, all based on my life experience and everything that's come my way from the environment and how I experienced it, and then how my significant caregivers and friends and family and every, everybody else, how they responded to what I then did, and they form that template, and it continues to grow and and change and evolve over time. And I think it's 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 just interesting to yeah it does evolve and grow and change over time. And once you have this awareness, you know that okay, then I've gotten into things like meditation and mm -hmm. mindfulness and things like that. And and you know realizing that I am not my thoughts. Yes. That kind of concept. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much you how far out into that sort of thing you get, but mm -hmm. I, I would imagine it's part of what you do, or maybe part of the way that you live your life. Absolutely, it's it is both. I remember. It's funny you say that. I remember the the time. Can't remember the details around it, but I do remember this one moment where I was. Um, I'd been doing a lot of personal growth work for a while, and had heard a little bit about meditation, kind of dabbled a little bit in it. But I remember running into this situation where I could feel the tension in my body. I was angry. I was frustrated, and. And, and feeling a little bit powerless at the same time, which was part of the frustration. But I remember both feeling it and feeling the, you know, tension and all of that. And also at the same moment, feeling as if I could watch myself being in that experience. And I was like, whoa, what is this? But the cool thing was about that was what was happening as that was occurring, because it was occurring simultaneously. I don't know what happened. I just stumbled into it, I guess. But when I was aware of it, I was actually choosing not to respond in the way I normally would have in the past. And I realized in that moment, I had a choice. I could respond the way I always had, or I could slow down, stop, and think about how I wanted the situation to play out. And so if you think about some of the things we've talked about, essentially... I brought my prefrontal cortex back online from the activated state of the limbic system. I was able to bring the part of my brain that normally is offline during stress response, bring it back online and both be in the experience and an observer of the experience. And I could then engage in choice and not just be reactive. And so a lot of times what I'll do with my clients in the beginning is, again, I get you know pretty complete trauma history as much as I can, and I'm testing out. Can this client really move into activation right away? Can they tolerate their body, their system, their nervous system? Can it tolerate starting to feel a lot? Or are they so overwhelmed or, or keeping things so tightly wrapped just to make it through the day that maybe we need to do a little bit of work, mindfulness, meditation, some of these kinds of skills and using a little bit of SE in a very um, small titrated way. It's one of the terms in SE I'll kind of circle back to in a minute. But slowly begin to gently open the nervous system a little at a time to increase its capacity to feel before we then get into the deep dives, into the deeper material. One of the things I love about SE and the reason why I took it on because as we talked about what can happen with EMDR earlier is it can overstimulate the system. And I was looking for a tool to help manage that. And SE just kind of naturally came into my life um, as a practitioner and then certainly personally um, to learn a little bit more about it. But anyway, uh, what I discovered was it's a very gentle way of just nudging the nervous system into a little discomfort and then back out of it and into it and back out of it. 
as I mentioned before, we slowly increase that capacity. So for somebody who thinks EMDR is too much, what I would do is we do that kind of pendulation back and forth. And by titrating, we're touching a little bit into the trauma or discomfort and then pulling right back out of it. So a little drop at a time until the capacity is big enough to handle going deeper into the trauma. Um, and I use mindfulness as a way to play around with that and to help people experience that and feel that and begin to gain that sense of observer in the moment. So with this, you talked about energy getting trapped in the body. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in my training through the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, we touched a lot on, and we've also talked about on this show, again, soundcloud.com slash get real to heal for past episodes. Dr. Charlotte Meyer had come on and talked about, she's an acupuncturist, mm -hmm. releasing energy in the body, yep. energy getting trapped. You know, how interested are, are you in, in, you know, fields like Chinese medicine and, and how this all overlays? I am very interested in it. I think there's a huge overlap. And a lot of what I will do with my clients um, because of the way trauma works in the body is I will, to the best of my ability, connect them with acupuncturists, massage therapists, um, yoga instructors, um, because I want people who do body work. Reiki is another wonderful thing to get people connected to. Anything that I can do to help them begin to become comfortable to gently and, and lovingly and um, compassionately connect in with their body and feel the presence of other people in order to reduce that the sensations that come up from that. And some of these other techniques and healing methods also just tap into the body's own physiological, natural response to just release the energy and let it go. I've heard people talk about being in an acupuncturist, and this has happened to me too, um, or being in a yoga session or doing Reiki and having these bubbles of thought or images or memories kind of float up when they're in the experience of something they had completely forgotten, didn't even know was there. And they've got needles in their legs or in their feet or in their knees. And all of a sudden something will come up and just float away and then the energy dissipates and they feel better. Their nervous system essentially is done similar to what I would do in a session. It's amazing how the body has this capacity to self-heal. And I love those techniques. It's been around for thousands of years, and in the Western world, we're finally integrating these things together. I honestly think that we have a bit of an ancient future coming our way. I think so, too. Yeah, I, I love that these ancient modalities that have been around for eons are, are being proven scientifically, and that way people can embrace them because that's what they apparently need. <laughs> Frankly, if it works, it works for me. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I've had that experience, and I want to also ask, so some of the what I've been processing in my own journey has been grief. Mm. So, you know, how, how do you help people to work with and process grief when that's such a big part of whatever trauma they're dealing with? Um, it's just another integral piece of the puzzle. So when we talked about the stress response cycle, part of the um, end of the stress response cycle is the discharge, discharge of energy. Crying is actually a discharge of energy. And they have now done studies on the, the biochemical makeup of tears. And the biochemical makeup of tears is different depending on what we're crying about. If we're crying from physical pain versus emotional pain, it is a different biochemical makeup. They're trying to understand it better so that they can give us more information about it. But they at least have validated that they are a little bit different. That being said, Again, working with folks, grief is just another kind of trauma. Um, and so it's just part of that discharge. And in some cases, there may not be a lot of fight or flight or anxiety or anger or whatever. Maybe they've already worked through that, or maybe it just doesn't last as long. It's more about allowing them to feel safe and comfortable into releasing that energy and then being on the other side of it. What do they need to take with them from this grief? What's the lesson? What are they letting go of and what are they carrying forward? Grief is a transition from where I was to where this next phase of life is going to be or letting go of this person and moving on to my life without them. Yet, even if I let go of a person, place, thing, job, whatever it happens to be, there's some part of them that impacted me that had a positive impact that I'm taking forward. How do we integrate that and move on 
knowing that there's still a part of who we are. This is still a part of our very being. Counseling is an art that you have mastered, and I thank you for being here to share your wisdom and knowledge today, Pete Sandoval. Thank you very much. Yeah, so let everyone know how they can reach out to you at New Insights Counseling. Sure. My phone number is 314-287-3088. You can reach me also on the web at newinsightsstl.com. By going to my website, you can link very quickly and easily to my Facebook and or Instagram pages. Find me there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. This has been Amanda LaPlante. You've been listening to Get Real to Heal on 92.9 FM, KWRH. For this and other episodes of Get Real to Heal, check us out at soundcloud.com slash Heal, or look for the live videos on YouTube at Get Real to Heal or on facebook.com slash Heal. You can also reach out to me anytime for a free consultation for my integrative health coaching services. AmandaLaplante.com is where you'll find me online. Have a great day. Thank you so much. The biochemical makeup of tears. That's amazing. Like that just blew my mind. Yeah. Awesome. Boom, boom, boom. I love boom, it. Boom, boom, boom. I was like, I was like, the can. I was like, that's a weird question to ask. Sometimes I just hear these little prompts, like, just mm-hmm. ask them that. And I'm like, really? That there's no segue to that. And there you wow. go. And brilliant. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, I was fascinated to find that out. Um, but the neurophysiology also, and I, you know. Again, my brain just keeps going. The neurophysiology shifts with the release of grief. It actually, again, resets because it's holding on to this sense of, what do I do now? What's going to happen? What does this mean for me? And as it lets go, it allows itself to be open to what's coming now. Yeah. It's another way of how we recontextualize. And the nervous system resets. And then we move forward. And again, I can make it. I'm through it. I'm okay. I will be okay. This is what I can do to continue moving my journey forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Go make it a great day.